Hey, and welcome into the show today. This is your host, Jake Jordan of The Productive Point of View, and I have with me a guest, a friend of mine from LinkedIn, Amy Butel, who is a fintech content creator. Amy, how are you doing today? Great, Jake. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm so glad to have you here because you're one of my favorite people to engage with on LinkedIn. I know. I love your stuff, too. It's so nice to engage in sort of in person. I know, I know. And I think that's one of the most interesting things that's come out of the last year um, is how people like us who have been on LinkedIn forever uh, saw it kind of explode and turn into this really interactive kind of nice place to interact with people, right? Yeah, build relationships. I mean, I think that's what it's all about. You know, the friendships. Hey, mm-hmm. let's let's be daring. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. You cool. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so tell us a little bit more about what you do on a day to day basis. I know you do several things, but let's just start with the the fintech content. Yes, I create content for um, different kind, all different kinds of fintechs. I've worked in like with blockchain payments. Right now, I have a client that's more like legal and regulation tech, um, like uh, p- platforms where uh, suppliers and their customers can discount invoices. I mean, hmm. I feel like my value proposition is that I can help companies understand and communicate their stories. Okay. And so financial technology is something that's grown a ton in the last couple of years, right? Just because the techs right. come so far in general. But of course, the finance industry is going to be one of those people that can benefit hugely from that. So what is it about fintech that either gets you excited or or stoked to write about? Or is it just something that you found an opportunity and are jumping in? I would say it's all of the above. I noticed I've been in financial services for as long as I've owned my business, but I started out really on the consumer investment side. So 18 years, like writing for consumers about mutual funds and individual stock investing. Okay. And as my career has evolved, I ended up doing a lot more B2B. Like for a long time, my specialty was asset management firms to financial advisors. That okay. was my thing for a long time. And then I noticed in the last year or two, I've, been, I've had sort of more and more fintech companies sort of creep in like through agencies or inquiries. And then it ended up being not just most of what I was doing, But what I got really excited about, because there was so much potential for, like, for the creative destruction that can Mm -hmm. yield, you know, because there's so many barriers between, you know, let's say even in B2B, B2C, and what fintech has the potential to do is to just knock a lot of that stuff out. So it can be much, so things, people can communicate more directly, processes can be really simplified, so it's not as difficult for these companies to do business. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really the potential of FinTech to, to help these companies become a lot more productive, like from your point of view, right. you know, by having processes and better systems and integration and really looking at the bottom line of what is our value proposition for the customer and how can we just sort of, you know, part the sea and really get to that and, you know, maybe outsource everything that doesn't accrete to that value proposition. Right. So as you're creating content and messaging and and things like that for these companies, you know, given just the way that the web's gone, you have to give people more upfront, right? You you have to prepare them and let them do their own research. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is all, it, you know, it kind of goes, it it goes back to basic content marketing principles of, you know, and having a pipeline and of, of, you know, just, you know, understanding your audience and, you know, how you can bring them along in that funnel. And it's all by, you know, by providing the information that your customers need so that they can find it and, you know, kind of move towards you. Right. If it's not an appropriate fit for you, you don't want them and they don't want you. And this is what I tell my students because I also teach undergraduates marketing and communications. And I tell my students, look, I could be a really good sales gal, but if I'm selling you something you don't need or want, you will never come back to me. But if I understand what you need and there's a meeting of the minds and I provide you with a valuable service, we have a, we already have a relationship and we're building trust. Right. Right. And so that's what it's all about. Right. And so, I mean, you hear a lot of people still talk about this, like how do you write for boring industries? But I think you almost just answered that unknowingly or it's probably built into your, your syntax now. Right. But 
it's, there is no boring industry if no. you're talking about things that matter to people. There's no boring industry because the problem, if I think something's boring, it's not my problem. So I don't care. Mm -hmm. If it's my problem, I care about it. You know, like if, 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 if my problem is that I'm a medium sized enterprise that can't source enough cash, you know, to keep that I have always have a cash flow problem or I can get cash, but it's so expensive that it's kind of raining on my parade. You know, I'm always having to look at, I'm spending too much money and we know what kills small businesses, a lack of cash flow. So then if I, let's say I'm working for a company that has the potential to expedite that cash flow in an affordable way, I would be all ears. That's not boring to me. It might be boring to me if I don't, it's boring to me if I don't need it. If I sure. need it, it becomes the most interesting thing I've ever heard, right? Sure. Especially if it's my business and it's my cash. Mm -hmm. So it's just, because I, I, I have a saying, if you try to be everything to everybody, you end up being nothing to no one. Yep. So, you know, I have, and I have found in my business, the more narrowly I focus things, Jake, for my target market, the more money I make, the happier I am, the better I do. Absolutely. So I think the problem is with some of these companies, they may be, you know, they're not, they need to really define who they're after and then really understand what's meaningful to those people and speak like meet those people where they are. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that real quick because I, in my clientele as well, I find that that's one of the biggest spots I wrestle with clients is narrow down to one target and to one promise. And right. then guess what? Your landing pages are really easy to write copy for. Yeah. How do you go about those conversations with clients? Well, I mean, I think because part of my advantage is because I'm a, I was trained as a journalist. Mm -hmm. I'm a really good interviewer. So, and it, and sometimes people say that's a lot of interviewing time because I, I want to interview people extensively up front, but it's not, or it's a lot of research time because if I need to understand you to help you. And a lot of times what you think is your value proposition. I've talked to so many of financial advisors who are like, Oh, I, you know, I provide great service. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, if you're not providing great service, you shouldn't even be in business. That That's is it. not a value proposition. Everyone's going to claim that, right? Yeah. And so I think a lot of it is like, I, I force not like aggressively, but I'm very persistent in pushing people. I keep pushing them to say, okay, I get that. But what about this? And I really force them also to look at, because I think it's a confluence of, you know, what people, your market wants and also what you're really good at. Because if it's not something that I really want to do, I'm going to go crazy with a lot of business, right? Exactly. Especially, yeah. you know, let's say, okay, yeah, my target market is maybe every small business that needs cash or as a financial advisor, maybe my target, I might think my target market is, you know, let's say widows, but I, I, I kind of push people deeper and say, okay, what is it? What are the kinds of people? Like if I'm meeting with a client today, am I going to jump out of bed and say, I can't wait to talk to Jake or think, oh my God. I got to meet with Jake today. Right. Right. You know, so you have to think about not just, you know, what those people need, but who they are. Right. And if mm -hmm. it's exciting for me to do business with you, because if it's not right. Right. So what why? do you, <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, and that's unfortunately one of the things that is easy to make yourself more valuable is if you can come with that attitude, you're probably half, in front of half the people out there that would be your competitors just by coming with enthusiasm and some passion around it. So I even mentioned something like that in one of the, the five video challenge up on LinkedIn. Uh, right. I, I spent a whole video on that, but um, so how, what would you say are you, that you find are some of your biggest distractions or challenges as you're going through and working with clients as a writer these days, like just you personally in your own workflow, what, what have you found is slowing you down or the, the classic, well, what's think, keeping you up at night question? I think the only thing that tends to slow me down is I, I get, I can get in my own way. I mean, if I get out of my own way, like if I, let's say an email from you comes in and you want to work with me and if I'm really hesitating, but I do it anyway, hmm. you know, I'm, I, it's not, I don't want to do it. I'm just doing it because I think I should. Hmm. I mean, when I'm in a really good zone, it's like, I am, I love everybody I'm working with. 
and then I don't have is the distractions because it just I only create the distractions if it's something I'm trying to avoid doing. Mm-hmm. You know, outside of yeah, maybe I spent a little too much time on Facebook today. So what? You know, I mean, I feel like the the it's easy to blame external distractions when it's really something that's going on with you. Mm. Like, what is it about that you're doing that you feel the need to be, you know, that's continually pushing you away from your work? Is it because you don't want to do it? Is it because you don't like the client? Is it because you have some big personal issue that you really should be attending to? Because like, I actually, yeah, I actually like had a personal thing come up next last week that was kind of like emotionally distressing for me. And it, it affected my work in a way, but what I basically did is I went and asked a few people if they really needed X on Monday. You know, gotcha. I actually, because I need, what I needed to do, Jake, is I needed to give myself emotional space to deal with my thing mm-hmm. instead of trying to ignore my thing and force myself to do the work that I wasn't really engaged with. And you know what? It worked out with everybody because I was really clear mm-hmm. and I always am like trying to get you stuff early. Mm -hmm. So, because I'm like, I want to do it. So Mm -hmm. the one time I might need a little more time, you're going to give it to me because you know, I'm not, I'm not like always trying to, you know, push you farther than you're comfortable with. So if you build good relationships, you're doing what you want and you're really cognizant of what's going on in your own head, all this stuff, I mean, I see time and time again, it all works out. It just like the project that I thought was going to be a big thing that was going to, I was going to take too much time this week. Well, somebody that I'm working with, you know, they had something come up. So therefore maybe that happens more next week. And so I can deal with the thing that pops up this week. If I, it's just, I think it can be when you're on the right track with yourself and with what you want to do, I found it can be very organic, hmm. right? I don't have to, I'm not enforcing. I don't have to be an enforcer with myself. Mm-hmm. because I'm, everything I'm doing is what I want to do. And when That's I'm interesting. In zone, yeah, when I'm in the zone of I don't want to do all these things, I have to start asking myself questions. That's like, great. Okay, let's go back to that, those gigs that I really didn't want to take, but maybe I chucked because of cash of fear or what, you know, or I just didn't ask that potential client enough questions to ascertain it was a good fit. Or maybe I really need to fire somebody kindly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe I need to say, you know, this is not working for me. And maybe here's maybe a couple people I can refer you to who would do mm-hmm. a better job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. And then there's two spots in there particularly that I really uh, resonated with personally is the questions. And we had a, a guest before that talked about that kind of a different way when it came to managing people. But same thing, very powerful. Why? is this a problem for me? Why that, yeah. do I not want to do it? And, and that's something I think you could add to a, a weekly routine even. Um, like, cause I plan on Sunday nights for my week yeah. with my clients and my, you know, my goals and objection objectives yeah. and things. And I think that'd be something super powerful to add uh, for me. And then the, the other part of it was that you said uh, firing clients, which yeah. I think a lot of people talk about, but I don't think that many people actually do it. Um, and, and all of that is, it's almost just like it's curating your own day for you, which is why it feels so organic. Yes. You know, it's yes. not, because I'm, I'm big on regiment. Uh, I need it. Otherwise, I, I fall off the tracks. I know myself right. well enough to go, I have to have boundaries and rules and for myself. And so it doesn't feel like I'm enforcing on myself. I'm like, oh, freedom. I know where I need to be. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. But not everyone is, the, is that way. And it sounds like right. you you have this just, kind of organic feel about if I ask these two questions and you know, I'm doing these two or three things, I'm, I'm in a good spot. Yeah. And I mean, of course I have deadlines like everybody, Mm -hmm. but like I said, it's just like when I let, when I'm present and I let it happen, it's just like, okay, this thing maybe, you know, that seemed like a big thing. Well, sorry, my cat is walking right underneath the screen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She wants a guest Um, appearance. Yeah, he wants a guest appearance. Um, you know, it just like it just adjusts itself when I don't fuss with it too much. Mm-hmm. And right now it's a lot because I'm teaching two classes this semester, which I've never done. Mm-hmm. You know, but I also at the beginning of it, I thought I just have to accept that for these three months, I'm going to be I might be working till 10 or 10 30 at night some days. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to be forever. And you know what? It's almost over. 
-hmm. because I haven't been going every week. I hate this. I can't do this. This is driving me crazy. This is awful because you know what? I did it all to myself. Mm -hmm. I said I was going to teach the classes. And I mean, I'm having like the most rewarding semester ever because I love my students. Like I actually sat in class yesterday in my communications class. I'm like, we have four classes left. And they're like, oh, <laughs> and when do you hear that? You know, like they, on some level, they don't want the semester to be over because we're having such a great time with each other. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, and we actually, they had a screw up with, we had a major screw up with podcasting technology and I just gave them deadline extensions. You know, because I'm like, it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't their fault. It just happened. But I wasn't going to like enforce. I'm like, I want you to make a good podcast. I said, but you also have to understand that this is going to run into all of our other deadlines and you're going to get your grades late. But that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So do you think that you're able to, to have this approach partially because you're so targeted, you know, right where you need to be? I think so. Yeah. And I've spent a lot. I mean, I won't, I don't. I wouldn't underestimate this to, you know, I wouldn't just like to, I wouldn't say to you that this process takes five minutes and then you can be in this zone. I mean, I have like had my head shrunk so many times. It should be about that big, <laughs> you know, because I've had to go, you know, cut through like what I thought I should be doing, what, you know, other people were telling me I should be doing right. And I've had all different phases of my life, you know, where I worked at home with little kids you know, and now I'm not, you know, now my kids are grown. I mean, so I've had to really be really clear about, spend a lot of time getting clear with, you know, who I am and what, and that changes, you know, you know, like I've been teaching, you know, which I love, but it's also ties me down, you know, right. in terms of my schedule. And, you know, that's not optimal now, especially because my parents are getting elderly and they're going to need more help. You know, so I think some of it is knowing yourself and then also understanding like there are external circumstances that there's, you know, like when I had, when my kids were home, my son had some like some special education needs in high school. And like, there was just a lot of things that I could not do. But I think when I just looked at that and accepted that that was the way it was, and I was fortunate that it was, it did end. But I think all that, you know, a lot of times we're fighting against reality, right? Mm. We're like, it shouldn't yep. be that way. Well, the fact is, it is that way. So, you know, what I would do then, I would say, okay, maybe I can't go away and meet my best friend at a spa for a week because I need to be home. I'm a single parent. But I can, like, schedule a massage every other week, you know, which a lot of people would be like, oh, my gosh, that's a lot of massage. Well, it was a trade-off for me, right? I couldn't do the yep. big vacation, but I could get a massage to reduce my stress. Mm -hmm. so I think that's the other piece is like knowing yourself and accepting whatever reality you're in. I love that. Fighting against reality. It's well, we do, right. It should be different. And that's where all like, you know, like I'm trying to go somewhere and there's a traffic jam. There shouldn't be any traffic. Well, there is. <laughs> okay. So let's just chill. Get over it. Yeah. But we don't, we, and then we do it. It's again, we're doing it to ourselves. We're saying, you know, I should have got more done today. Well, you didn't. Is the world really going to come to an end because, you know, and, and we, un we discount the value of what we did accomplish, mm -hmm. right? Because we're so focused on, you know, I have my, I've actually, this is one of my little tips. This okay. is my to-do list. Okay. Because I used to have a to-do list like this. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then every, at the end of every day, I could beat myself up because I could never, there's no way. <laughs> and I will not let my list get any longer than this. And actually, this is my weekly list. Oh, wow. You know, because that's I boil fun. it down to what I absolutely have to get done. And if yeah. I get more done, that's very nice. But I'm not, I feel like I've, I've, I, I don't pressure myself and I'm a lot more realistic. You know, again, accepting reality. Mm -hmm. You know, I am not going to get, I don't, you know, especially like right now because I'm teaching these classes and then I have like, I just had a call with a client. And I'm like, I'm going to be on a podcast in five minutes. I got to go, <laughs> you know, and then I got to go do, do something else at 1230. And then I have class at two. So, I mean, my, so my work day is really going to be my work night. Right. Because I don't have time. And so that means I'm going to have to work till 930 or 10. And that's okay right now, not forever, but right now. Yeah. I think that's a perfect segue to into the, what the last question I had for you was, uh, cause we always end with this, uh, is, what if you had an hour to work tomorrow? That's all you had. And the next right. day you had to have a lead, uh, a piece of copy written, something you had to have a result the next day. What would you spend that one hour on? Because it sounds like right now 
you know, that weekly list is most people, half of most people's daily to-do list, right? Which I right. love that. I have a very similar approach. I was looking for mine to put on camera, but right. I'll just have to put a picture of it in the, in the blog when we do this. But I did the same thing because there's only one or two things you have to accomplish each day uh, to, to reach your goals, right? right. Um, and it frees you up for the rest of the day to, to take on the fires yeah, and things. that's what I would do. I mean, sometimes, you know, I have days where I might literally have, like on Thursdays, I um, go up to, I live, I live in South Carolina and I'm an hour away from Asheville, North Carolina. So every Thursday night, I go up to Asheville for an intensive Buddhist book study. So Thursdays, excuse me, Thursdays, not Wednesday, I don't have a lot of time. So I may literally, I think tomorrow, I literally have two hours to get work done. So yeah. I have, one, I have one, one part of one thing that I know I need to get done. That's it. One part, I have a, like a research report that's due Friday, Monday in that time. So I want to get, I want to get, definitely get one section done and start another. If I could get two sections done, that would be great, but I'm not prosecuting myself about that. That's what I was, that's what I was going to ask. So how, how do you stay okay with that? How do you not crucify yourself at the end of the day and go, ah, another Thursday wasted? Because I know I am really, I'm, I'm tuned into the reality of my life, Jake. Yep. This is, yep. it's important enough for me to, I really, going up to Asheville for that book study is important enough for me that that's, I just know that's what my Thursday's like. And see, that will, I mean, it won't, it won't really change next semester, but it will change in the summer and probably the fall because I won't be teaching on Thursday. So that's going to free up maybe mm -hmm. two hours. So then I'll have four hours on Thursday. Well, and technically on your Thursday list, the book intensive is yeah. one, one of the things. Yeah, it so, is. It'll be on the so, list. So that's, that's a check. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, again, really being tuned into reality. And I understand what I want out of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand, like, you know, and it changes. And that's why I think we continually have to, like, write, you know, I had kind of a cash flow crunch over the summer. Mm -hmm. So that means some of what I'm doing now is making, is replenishing mm -hmm. all my coffers. So that means I'm taking on more. Like normally I would not be working this much, but as you know, the, our, the trajectory of our clients needs doesn't always follow. Like ideally I would have been a lot busier in the summer when I wasn't teaching, but it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I'd also broken my leg over Easter. So I honestly really needed some recovery time. Yep. And I think if we also look back, things work out really the way they're supposed to, because that's how they do work out. Mm -hmm. Right. Life happens, right? Yeah. So now I'm busier than I would like to be, but there's, you know, I'm just kind of grooving with it. I'm like, okay, like there I was last night. I talked to a friend, you know, when I really should have been working. So I, I didn't finish the quarter of 11, but that was okay because I want, I intentionally wanted to have that conversation. Sure. Sure. That's great, Amy. That's great. What, so where can people find you? Like if they want to come hang out with you, like I do, like what, <laughs> what would they do? Uh, LinkedIn is great. Uh-huh is the best. I also have a website, um, lake effect creative.com. Uh -huh. Um, oh. that's pretty much it. That's really, yeah, that's right. LinkedIn is really, okay. I mean, I'm not even paying that much attention to my website anymore. I spend a lot more time on my LinkedIn profile summary uh -huh. than I do on my website. That's right. Because Good. I think people Google you and they look at LinkedIn and that's, you know, that's what I feel like really reflects. And that's where we can get this engagement. Right. Because I'm not going to engage with people on my website. They just basically get my contact information. Right. Well, and you're yeah, I'm all about, yeah, I'm all about like you building relationships. And this is how I build relationships really on LinkedIn. Right. Yep. And especially the industry you're in. It makes sense. Uh, yeah. But I think anybody, anybody can benefit from that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, Amy, it's been fun. I think there's some really great stuff in here that people are going to enjoy. I've got a great quote already for it. I love it. So um, thanks for joining on. Appreciate you yeah. having you today. Thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk again soon, all right? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.